Well, welcome to the program, everyone. It's House of Decline. I'm, my name is Stephen. I'm here with my co-host, Alex. Hi. Hi. And, it, wow, what a week. It's been a great week for me. I got a lot of stuff done throughout the week. I've been cooking like crazy. I've been cooking huge dishes and then freezing them into small in, in small containers or portioning out servings. I have about 40 servings frozen in a deep freezer now in the basement. Mm -hmm. Um going to try to get 100 servings frozen and and you know ready to go for when the baby comes and we can just pull a pull a little aluminum dish out, heat it up in the oven and then throw it away after we eat it. So you're planning ahead. Exactly. You're squirreling away like the like the uh like the doleful ant as opposed to the irresponsible grasshopper who just spent all winter jacking off, you know. Yeah. Uh well I did spend all winter jacking off, uh so I was being the irresponsible <laughs> grasshopper. But it's you know, I'm doing pretty good with the preparations cuz I think with a newborn I'm probably not going to feel like cooking. And the clock is nah, nah. clock is ticking. It's going to it's like a month and a half or less. Until my entire mm -hmm. life changes. Yes. yes. Well, I mean, it'll just be a continuity, really. Now, what is a change but just uh, uh, adjusting to a new normal? Mm. See that? See that was pithy there. Yeah. That was a really pithy response. You should uh, you should uh, thank me because I've now cured your anxiety. Uh, I don't have any anxiety about anything anymore. I killed that part of my brain. I poured alcohol. That's, how on did the, you kill? Yeah, I just poured straight <laughs> denatured alcohol directly in. I did trepanning. I drilled a hole into my brain and poured alcohol right onto that spot that does anxiety, and I don't yeah. feel it anymore. Now I replaced that with horniness. I put, <laughs> yeah. and I, you know, smart, an intellectual horniness like this. Richard Dawkins uh, uh, little clip I wanted to bring here. Take a take a quick listen. See if you can hear this. Okay. Let's hear it. And so um, sexuality, too, can flower in the sorts of ways that, that, that literature and art fl flower um, and emancipate itself from its evolutionary roots. And, of course, that's what's happened. Um, it fl flowers. The sexuality fl flowers. The, the sexuality blooms like the yonic flower of the, of the old gods... Uh, it shines in my face, mocking me. Why can't I have it? Why can't I have it? Why was I molested at prep school? Uh, it, have you actually? That's that. Uh, that is true. Have you ever seen Richard Dawkins' comments about you know just the general molestation that goes on at prep school? Is that why he stopped believing in God? Is that why? Uh, <laughs> no, I think he <laughs> no because his comments were positive. I, oh, I think he's they, into they it. went something along. Well, there, it was something along the lines of "There's nothing wrong with a little harmless touching up," you know. It's you know, boys, you know, will be boys. It's just like uh, you know, when you're on the high seas, you revert to sodomy. Mm -hmm. uh, and right. You, when you're when you're in a, a highfalutin prep school and you're a Harry Potter all boys situation, you start fucking each other. Yeah, when you're trapped in a Russian rehab by your possessed daughter, you naturally start <laughs> making a relationship with the orderlies. Okay. <laughs> Look. Dimitri, I'll suck your dick if you can get me more benzos. Oh, Dimitri. Okay. Oh, how I pine for thee, Dimitri. <laughs> you have a soft, supple frame. It reminds me of when my wife wasn't so saggy. Oh, no, my dying wife. I'm so depressed, <laughs> I have to take tranquilizers. <laughs> I'm injecting tranquilizers directly into my eyeballs now. <laughs> This is the sound of the Peterson losing consciousness. Here, as I drift into dreamless sleep, will I find my absolution. Sleep now, Peterson. Sleep, gentle Peterson. <laughs> Go into that good night. <laughs> so I listened to a bit of the podcast, the Peterson podcast, with Barry Weiss. Um, Barry Weiss. Boy, what a slog that was. So I ended, I quit listening when they started quibbling over systemic racism. Um, yeah. And Jordan Peterson doesn't like the word systemic. So his problem with <laughs> systemic racism is like, it's like the whole thing was set up 
with racism in mind. And so he's he, <laughs> so he he is saying that we shouldn't use the word systemic because it's not the central tenet of you know the founding of this country. We didn't found this country in order to be racist specifically. Before critical race theory, I did not consider that the Lion King may have had a racial element to it. Now I can't unsee it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so he would probably prefer calling it in. I mean, he probably wouldn't, but, I mean, you can try to get around it by saying, okay, fine, endemic racism. You don't want to say sis racism. systemic. Why don't we say call it endemic racism everywhere all the time? Um, so you That's know. very Jungian. You know, it's like an innate racism. It's not yeah. like it can't be a part of the system. It can only be a part of your individual or sexual desire. Like, you know, you, you're, you're mythologically motivated to do racism, and it's only on an individual level. So, yeah, we didn't, you know, or not we, I guess we, the founding father people didn't explicitly found America to do racism. They just, it was just something everyone already did and that was baked yeah. in. And so Jordan Peterson doesn't like to use the word systemic, but uh, I, that's like a quibble. You know, that's not a yeah, real. That's, a, that's semantics. That's the lamest type of philosophical argument. Yeah, but it, words change meaning all the time, and they don't mean anything. I mean, it made Barry Weiss come immediately. Just like, oh yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Is it hard for Barry Weiss to keep kosher when she's such a fucking little pig? Ooh, <laughs> well, we'll have to edit Squeal! that out. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's what you're what you're doing is wrong. Uh, let me just say, what am I doing is wrong? I don't know. Um, is that misogynist? No, she's a fucking little piggy. Why don't we? She's a tiny little piggy. Why don't we try to explore the debate around enlightenment values only using dick jokes? Okay, uh, the debate around <laughs> enlightenment values. What is the dick critique of pure reason? Um, I don't know. <laughs> is that enlightenment? <laughs> enlightenment is, that, is, what is like Kant? using reason to determine. Yeah, uh, Descartes. Oh, uh, I dick, therefore I am. Yeah. I think, therefore I dick. I think therefore uh, I dick. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 That's what I want. There wanted. you go. That's, Only dick jokes. That's I what dick, I wanted. I dick, therefore I balls. <laughs> <laughs> I, dick, I dick, therefore I balls. <laughs> It's stupid. No, that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to generate the the good free association jokes. Trying to generate the cum tent. A mm, uh, little bit. Yeah. Uh, what what are uh, what are other Enlightenment values? I mean, that was like uh, Enlightenment era. We're talking about like Voltaire, right? Got authors like Voltaire. Well, no, Voltaire is like the is the clown who would. Um, who would just do like contrarian comedy about it? He wasn't like necessarily seriously writing stuff about how you know he, man has fundamental rights, like humanism. But who is like an author? Like uh, uh, Goethe? Probably is John like Locke is one of them. Oh, okay. So it's like if you mix your labor with with the. That's when he said, when he said, mix your labor with the earth, I always found, like, a guy just coming into the ground and being like, it's mine now. I've mixed my cum with the ground. Mm. My cum is my labor. <laughs> Hobbes. Or, like, you bury your fetus Hobbes in the is ground. another one. Yeah. All these guys who are like, do, do, it, do individuals have any rights? Like, is there any rights that they have? And, like, uh, they're like, well, you can generally try to let them, like, have customs. Nasty, brutish, and short describes my penis. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> got him nice uh, yeah montesquieu is one i don't know that one um, i don't know that one he wrote a book called the spirit of my dick which is a treatise on, <laughs> <laughs> it's a treatise on political theory in 1748 uh, okay let's see who else was there yeah voltaire is, is on the list uh, He's on the list of Enlightenment guys. Yeah, you know, most a lot of them. You can really sort of disregard the French ones, like Rousseau. You can just <laughs> that he sucks. Oh Rousseau yeah, sucks. Rousseau was like uh, he was like the noble savage. Yeah, that, that's we did. The a, thing about the noble savage is that they have huge dicks. Yeah, <laughs> and we know we envy these dicks as French people because you know we like to love and we feel that the huge dicks would be useful for love. 
But you know that is why we that is why we uh, love the noble savage, you know. Uh, and I guess uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is on here. That's an interesting. Oh, Mary Wollstonecraft, early feminist, Dick and, the early feminist, Dick and uh, the early white feminist. In mm. the, yeah, uh, talk about talk about I dick therefore I balls. No, revolutionary idea. I vag therefore I clit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fucking stupid yes fucking stupid yes um so i actually heard on come down an interesting idea that i wanted to just repeat uh which is that yeah. the, the italians invented obesity <laughs> uh i i feel like they're they're shying away from the greeks contribution to obese. i feel like the greeks were obese well i what, think what was like the the germans maybe i don't know did the germans invent obesity what was the first nation state capable of generating enough wealth such that people could be obese? I think America. I think, I think so. it's America. Really, I America think... invented yeah, uh, hyper obesity. Yeah, I think like, America was the I, first. Our, our modern conception of obesity. Yeah, I think you're right. But but which sub ethnicity in America was it that did it that we can blame? <laughs> it was the Germans. It was, the it Germans. was absolutely the German. <laughs> oh, I like German American. I like to have my sausages. I like to have my gravies. I like to have my biscuits. <laughs> and I guess it's not the Germans. The McDonald brothers, the inventor of McDonald's, were of, of Scots Irish descent. Ray Kroc was Polish. Well, uh, Ray Kroc. I mean, the McDonald's brothers just wanted to sell burgers, and Ray Kroc uh, deceived them. Hmm. I saw the Michael Keaton. I love Michael. I Keaton. love that movie. I thought that, that movie. You love you like the founder. You're a founder. Oh my stand? god, I love that movie. It's so it's because it's so like real politique about capitalism. It's like this guy saw someone else's idea and ruthlessly stole it from them, and then just like came up with a way to make money that wasn't about the food or the people. It was real estate, and it's, I just love it. Yeah. That's it's an amazing story, McDonald's, in terms of like uh, giving yourself to the void. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and you know, at fifty-four, this guy who'd been you know uh, bandied about by by the tether of capitalism uh, finally accepted the Dark Lord. He had he had a lightning bolt from the Dark Lord, and he struck. He saw opportunity, yeah. uh, and he felt no qualms about where it went. Uh, and I think there it's weird because like the movie tries to present it as a cautionary tale, <laughs> but it's yeah, I don't know. It's not that it glamorizes it, but it's like, I mean, what did we learn? Nothing, really. He he, he died a very wealthy man and he was a, a dick. And but he still had people that liked him. So what do you want? It's not we, we didn't learn anything. Yeah. It, capitalism is bad. <laughs> it's it's kind of I would. Uh, do a double feature with the founder with that um oh boy now i can't remember the name of the racing movie about oh ford versus ferrari okay did you see that one i didn't see that one. ford versus ferrari like hints around at like um a, a little bit of about capitalism and big industry um mm -hmm. and one of the characters is like henry ford the third who's the ceo of uh ford during the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. um and how the, the bureaucracy of the Ford Motor Company got in the way of the ideals, which is go fast, make car go fast, and like the the mm -hmm. the um, the the really talented mechanic who's good at making car go fast, like is is really constrained by this capitalist bureaucracy and the big wigs at Ford who who really want to preserve the image of Ford, so it like. The car has to look cool, but, you know, Christian Bale's character is like, no, you, it's got to be more aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a fight. You know what that is? That's just the fountainhead, right? You mm -hmm. know, a uh, uh, genius coming to grips with the mediocre effects that uh, society. I mean, that's what's weird about the fountainhead is like. The the architect is still persisting in capitalism. He's just dragged down by mediocre apparatchiks within capitalism. So I don't. Maybe I'm reading that book wrong. Right. I haven't maybe read it. I haven't read it. But I think everyone can agree that we don't like mediocre apparatchiks. No, that's me, and we don't like me. <laughs> hey, that can be me too. I remember when I was working at the insurance company, 
there was a lady who called a caller, a, a customer who was didn't want to talk to me because she thought I was incompetent. And I was like, that's mm-hmm. me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, it's that thing where there's a general attitude, I feel, not to do like generational commentary because it's the worst dumbest commentary on earth and generations don't actually exist but here you go anyone below a millennial uh, uh, like i feel is much nicer to people in the surface industry nope. in general i see young people are are way 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 nicer nope. to people no nope. i would in disagree the surface industry than i boomers. don't think so i think it's and i just think that you have had maybe a when was the last time you were in a service job though the last time i was in a service like job five, was five six years ago more more than well i mean my job right now involves a lot of service actually Mm. so it involves a huge amount of customers but no no uh no in like a really in like a uh the last time i did that was probably when i was a bike courier yeah Uh, you should never does that count as a service i don't know but you should never have done that dangerous job you crazy man i was i was hit uh by four cabs in three months yeah that's (laughs) Gotta be well, by hit I mean like <laughs> by hit I mean like their their mirror clipped me and I skidded out a little but I wasn't run over or anything. Well, you but, probably would have been at one point. And I was also doored uh and then uh I was riding on the sidewalk carelessly and my bike got crunched under a cab that was going into a parking lot. Oh. <laughs> Um, and uh, that- yeah, bike couriers are really. I feel like I've like I'm tougher than cops because I had I was a bike courier for four months. Oh man, I'm not tougher than anybody. I'm the <laughs> <laughs> I'm a weak little doughboy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, I, could, I cannot claim. I could probably outwalk the average American. <laughs> probably walk farther for longer than the average guy. <laughs> That's good. If you were ever, if you were ever in a situation where you needed to outwalk somebody, yeah, like I could probably outwalk like people who are way better at other things that I think I'm good at. Like, for example, like if you were being chased by like Chris Benoit, do you think you could outwalk Chris Benoit? Uh, no, but I, I could probably, if I was going to challenge John Mayer to guitar playing, I would be like, it's a combination walking and guitar playing challenge. So who can? play guitar and walk the longest and i think i would win every time yeah uh <laughs> why do you bring up john mayer oh uh, well, he's got a horrible new song out but he's got a <laughs> he's got a pink he's got a pink prs so i like the guitar um mm-hmm. i want the guitar but it's just a really bad song i think it's called last train home um last train home yeah i heard a clip of it you were playing a clip of it before the show uh, and it sounds like a Lionel Richie song. He's uh, deliberately attempting to ape a big 80s-sounding gated reverb snare type. Everybody dance. He actually the wasn't using. In the air. He actually wasn't using gated reverb on the snare. Um, You're right. Sorry. So it's, it fails. It well, fails. No. I mean, he's doing conceit. gated. Gated reverb on the snare is not every 80s song. Like, it's kind of a turning it's every point. every 80s song. Sometimes they just go... Sometimes they just go big reverb on the snare, no gate at all. And that's yeah. what he was doing there. He was doing a big... Big reverb snare. Big reverb on the snare. Um, I love doing gated reverb. I'm doing it on all my songs lately. Um, mm-hmm. It's just fun to set up. Yeah. Yeah. You've been, you've been, making, you've been making a lot of uh, sad Patriot synth wave lately. Yeah, n- nostalgia wave. Yeah, nostalgia way. It's fun because I like playing with nostalgia, politically. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, we love we love the past. We love to hearken back to a past that never existed, or some mm-hmm. sort of grand state, or the idea that things were better long ago. Right. I mean, to some degree, I wonder. Yeah, you, know, you, you we the show is House of Decline, but we still don't know if things are getting worse or not. Well, it's still hard to tell. One of the so I read this essay by Christopher Lash called "The Politics of Nostalgia," and one of the causes he goes through di- what maybe like three different potential causes of mm-hmm. nostalgia, um, and one of the causes is an empire in decline. Decadence and decline is one of the possible mm-hmm. reasons for an upsurge in nostalgia because you're th- you're hearkening back to a better age, and yeah. um, 
so you have like a form of nationalist nostalgia and since everything's in decline it can serve like escapism what i would say to that is the decadence and decline um drives the nostalgia it's the nostalgia isn't a symptom of the decadence and decline but the decadence and decline uh generates nostalgia because like look at marvel or the fact that anything that has any sort of big media impression is previously held IP or a remake. And the fact that that's so much more prevalent than it was in uh, previous in previous times. Uh, so th- we're, we're in this state of uh, this constantly recycling uh, money because we're in this late stage capitalism where um, you have to make a safe bet each time. There's no you you have to there's no way you can take a chance on anything because the fucking suits, the fucking suits say you got to make a profit each time. And the only way to do that safely is be by recycling IP. Yeah. And so may is that a symptom of decline? The idea that you're always just hearkening back to this. I don't think so. Uh, dollar. There, so this, mm-hmm. the second type, the second sort of um, exa- uh, example he talks about is we've had different periods of like sort of over overwhelming nostalgia um for example in 1971 time magazine asked how much nostalgia can america take and it was this overwhelming wave of nostalgia in the 70s and interestingly he talks about how the 60s and the 50s were like made into this big nostalgic time even by like 1971 People were talking about the 60s as a thing, as a time, as an era. Um, yeah. So, and he, he cites a couple of historians who basically were tracking that Americans have always been nostalgic, like the <laughs> whole time. We're just a nostalgic people. Yeah. It's one theory, which I find it it's it's nostalgia is serving something for our own emotional needs in this theory. It's... It's making stuff that seems incoherent become coherent, it's providing continuity, but above all, it's mm. it's like a soothing emotional pacifier in a way. Yeah. Well, I don't there is like if you talk about nostalgia from the outset of the founding of America, I I think what we don't really consider in America is how deeply indigenous culture is rooted in america you know the fact that uh, tons of cities are named after indigenous like anglicized versions of indigenous names and the anglicization of indigenous culture is is part of it and i think the nostalgia comes like when people first started settling in when white people first started settling in america like tons of them defected to indigenous tribes they they hearken back to that because in a way you're sort of nostalgic for that uh less industrial more in touch with the world uh uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle where you know you don't have to work as much and you don't have to pledge fealty to a cruel god uh you know a lot of that happened and i think a lot of that idea of indigenous uh indigenous culture uh, beset with freedom uh wormed its way into this uh anglicized version of that which they they were hearkening back to this while simultaneously destroying it. Um, and then the founding fathers, you know, they came along and instantly they mm-hmm. developed a mythology. Like within a year after they all died, they all became, you know, legends and gods and statues were made of them. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I mean, one of the other explanations of nostalgia is future shock which is when Mm -hmm. a society starts to transition due to advancements in technology. Um, Mm -hmm. So that can be thought of as a cause. And when uh, America started being colonized, that was an element of future shock probably for indigenous people. It would be interesting Mm -hmm. to hear any perspectives on the concept of nostalgia among indigenous people in terms of before and after the the great apocalypse occurred Mm -hmm. i think yeah i i would be like i wonder what it's like to also like a culture that seems uh you know i like if i i'm i'm just spitballing here i'm ignorant so forgive any proclamations i make about indigenous culture 
but uh, a, a society that's more invested in ancestor worship, like which isn't just indigenous peoples. Like uh, in China, there's a lot more emphasis, you know, paid to like paying homage to your ancestors as opposed to our culture, which sacrifices old people and like says, forget your past. We can move on. Um, so, you know, I wonder what the idea of nostalgia is like from a culture that is all about your lineage and, and, uh, seeing yourself as a continuity of that. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary? Cause when you say nostalgia, it's sort of, it has a negative connotation to it. It's remembrance of the past, but in sort of this cloying, treacly way, yeah. in a way that's like not attainable. Uh, it's funny. Nostalgia used to be a medical term that someone yeah. someone would suffer from it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doctor. Well, you know, you used to suffer from the gay, and then now you suffered from uh, you suffered from liking Funko Pops too much. Uh, well, like, I would love to go to the doctor and be like, I have this like melancholic feeling about the past that i was that i never actually lived in can you help me mm -hmm. and they're like yeah that just what you got to do is put a poultice up your ass make you got to chew you got to chew some herbs that you find in the forest spit it into a bowl and then kind of rub your your hands together so it forms a long snake and then mm -hmm. put it in your ice box and once it's frozen sit on it Mm -hmm. Nostalgia cured. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I like the idea that like there are periods where mythologies build up, and then there are sort of massive traumatic events that happen that make people fixate on the before time. Because mm -hmm. like you're talking about the '60s, and like uh, the gag of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is that the Manson murders is the thing that killed the '60s, right? Mm -hmm. it, like killed the hippie dream because a bunch of idealistic young hippies went and murdered a bunch of people in the Hollywood Hills and it made national news and they had quoted the Beatles and, you know, it was just wrapped up with so much of the, uh, the zeitgeist, uh, that it managed to kill that whole vibe. And so the seventies became this depression, cocaine laced, you know, rem ha remember happy days, remember Greece, you know, remember yeah, the fifties. That was a nostalgia you know? wave. Yeah. Which is the kind and of then, the kind of music I'm trying to make now, the nostalgia wave. Yeah. It's very 70s. Well, uh, the music you're making sounds 80s, which is the uh, 80s-ish. I'm nostalgia bending. 80s was bending. the build-up in America. Yeah, I'm nostalgia yeah. bending. Yeah. It's a form of psychic uh, circuit, circuit bending, if you will. It's called nostalgia But the, the 80s is very relevant to our thing because our mythology for our generation got built up in the 80s and built up in the 90s where you had this end of history moment and then you know, you can guess what the big traumatic event that ended that was the 80s and the 90s when when the doctors the saw my my baby dick and it was so big that it made national <laughs> news was that you're right when that's I, what ended everyone got really bummed out by the huge dick baby yeah, that's, what, that's what ended the 80s my was like that's what ended dick the 80s. With, baby with huge dick born oh man i didn't want to see that <laughs> I don't want to see a baby with a huge... Why did they show all these pictures of the baby with the huge dick on CNN? <laughs> Making everyone feel uh, bad. <laughs> no, it was 9-11. 9-11 oh. was the big traumatic break in the uh, idea of the end of history. Hell yeah, I was ducking planes for years after that. <laughs> Are you kidding? Every time I heard a plane, I was like, duck and cover! I would take a dive. I would dive under a chair for the, the couple of weeks after 9-11. Shit was scary. Mm -hmm. It was whack. Yeah. But, you know, after the Berlin Wall fell, uh, like, uh, America's powers were just rapidly increasing in the 80s because of cheap uh, credit. And uh, the USSR was falling apart. And they had largely been seen as when the Cold War, uh, the Berlin Wall fell. And suddenly, neoliberalism had won. Uh, there were no more wars left to fight. We were in the myth-making mode. Our legends were created. You know, Weird Al Yankovic yeah. and, and, uh, and the Simpsons, you know. Uh, these were these are the mythologies that we still hearken back to. Yeah, hearkening back. I'm saying that a lot. I say hearken a lot. Baron Harkin from Dune. Baron Harkinen. Baron Harkinen. He's Harkinen. Harkinen back for better terms. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, I am Harkinen back. Is that his voice? I like not that. That's not an impression we we need to continue on the show. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No. Do you want to suck my dick? 
Do you like Star Wars? <laughs> I like the idea of Dune. They like Star Wars. Uh, Big so, fans of Star so Wars. So besides and the Dune besides the the future shock, like when you rapidly industrialize, and that's why you, you're doing nostalgia to, to like protect your brain from the shock of the printing press. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's the per perception of decline, which we covered. And then another yeah. one is identity repair. Identity repair. Yeah. Elaborate. Um. So. Christopher Lash doesn't believe that we have the freedom to create our own identity, which I kind of agree with him on about some fundamental aspects. Aspects. Oh. Um, well, I like my my take on it is that we have a personal version of our identity, but our what our identity actually is is a dialogue between us and the entire world. You know, we don't control every aspect of our identity. Uh, we should. We we well, I don't know even if we should, but we should be able to. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Go on. So what we do is is that we're always trying to like banish the memories that cause us pain and repress them. But we can't do it, and so we manipulate mm -hmm. the past to suit our purposes now to piece together a usable past um, so that our, our identities are uh, valid according to the norms of the time. So, okay, yeah. that, this is a little abstract to me, so, so provide an example. Uh, let me see. If I can, if he like, has... is it if you're traumatized or like you've had something bad happen to you, you sort of can escape into the fantasy of something that didn't exist in order to uh, fulfill that empty part of you? Or is yeah, that so this a is reading this is the most abstract part of his art of of the three causes of, of it. Um, so his examples are the postmodern revival of earlier styles in art, architecture, popular music, and dress. Um, he, he says. This serves not to bring them back to life, but precisely to exaggerate our distance from them. Um, it is mm. only when they are believed safely dead that earlier styles become eligible for restoration, not as landmarks in a continuing tradition, but as historical curiosities, objects of a kind of attention that mingles affection and condescension, which is the kind of nostalgia that I'm kind of going for with the music. It's cheap, shitty-sounding 80s synths that in the 80s, everyone thought the synths were horrible, and they loved the music of Led Zeppelin with guitars. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. now we have actually expensive or great capabilities to make electronic music, and we're making 80s-sounding music with it. So it's a historical mm -hmm. curiosity, and it has affection and condescension, and it's serving the purpose of, like, making a kind of eclectic identity, if you will. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't really, Christopher Lash doesn't really um, land on any one of these three causes. He's just, I like the mm -hmm. essay because he's not being unifactorial about it. Mm -hmm. He's not deciding on one explanation. He just mm -hmm. is like, these are the three things... Uh, and then at the end, of course, he's like, oh, I asked Gore Vidal, and he said it's all made up by the media. So Gore Vidal's take on nostalgia is all made up by the media. There's no such thing as nostalgia. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I had a moment... Here's my collection of old Aubrey Beardsley pornography, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I had a moment where I accidentally came up with something that I thought was clever. It turned out Gore Vidal had said it already. <laughs> and that he's was, a genius, That Gore. was when I, I was like... Um, ancestral blackout the concept of forgetting what your ancestors have done due to subsequent generations of them being blackout drunk for the majority of their lives <laughs> gore <Right. Vidal> already <laughs> thought of that um yeah <laughs> which is funny it's like because i was thinking about white guilt and how all of my ancestors were probably so drunk that they didn't pass down the white guilt to their children and so that's why we don't have white guilt, because we were too drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that's the lesson here, kids. Isn't that funny? If you feel guilty, if, if, if the social justice warriors are getting you down by making you feel bad for considering your privilege, get real drunk. It'll go down easier. <laughs> yeah. You won't think about it as much. 
Right. That's basically kind of what um, what I was getting at. It's so it was so it's like a way of evading responsibility in an interesting way. So uh, everything in moderation. I was moderation. drunk that whole time. Yeah, I was drunk that whole time. I what wasn't me. Right. Can't be. <laughs> <laughs> can't you can't There's blame me. There's no consent there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing that you hear, like, uh, when people, uh, fr- frequently in college, I remember people having drunk personas, mm-hmm. you know, uh, people they would transform into when they were six tequilas deep yeah, and such, and they would start climbing trees and, you know, whipping their dick out. And, right. Oh, it's so terrible. Yeah. I, I, I don't even, I don't, I don't want to continue the conversation any further. Um. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> but that was, I, w- we are many people. Uh, I was having like, I, I went over to my dad's house for the first time in a while yesterday, uh, where my grandma also is. I saw my aunt, my aunt. Um, and apparently I was born with a skin tag. Apparently I was born with a vestigial twin. Or they're talking about my aunt, uh, my other aunt, uh, who has, uh, heterochromia Mm -hmm. one eye is blue and one eye is brown Mm -hmm. and so they started talking about chimerism for some reason and you know uh, maybe that's why she's so fucked up all the time is because chimerism what's chimerism Um, when you absorb your twin in the womb and uh Hmm. part of your dna gets overwritten with their dna oh yeah that's gotta Uh, be bad yeah, that's I don't know. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, gonna give you a psychic damage. Your two neck is you. You ate another person. You absorbed another person. But apparently, I was born with a skin tag that was a vestigial twin. Oh wow! Uh, and so maybe I am a chimera. May I am a chimera. you maybe I uh, am a grafted human. Yeah, you're, well, I mean, I don't want to talk any more about uh, wonderful anime Hunter Hunter, but. You remind me of those. Talk, talk, those talk two, and the two the tiny, ant. the two. Okay, no, let's talk the about the two it. tiny royal uh, royal guards after they've they've given the king their life. The two tiny little mm-hmm. royal guards. Uh, that was your skin tag, vestigial twin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was Mentutu Yupi and uh, Shia Poof, uh, but the tiny chibi versions of them. So uh, no, let's talk. No, let's let's fucking no, get into it now. Let's do it. Let's do, uh, I haven't let's do finished. The, you I you finished. after our Hunter Hunter episode, you watched the fifth and perhaps the greatest season but I'm or not, the season that Hunter Hunter's most known for. I'm not done The yet. Chimera Antarctic. I'm not done yet. You can't spoil it. I haven't. I have like. Oh, no. I have like three episodes to go in the Chimera Ant arc, so you cannot mm-hmm. spoil it. I'm not gonna um, spoil it. It got but, super gay. It's how so? How do you mean it got so like it got more overtly homoerotic yes, between Gon with, and Kirua? With the royal ant guard uh, Shia Poof and his interactions oh, yeah, Shia. with the king, he's he's always the king is like complimenting him and then he has like a two minute orgasm. Yes, I mean Shia Poof <laughs> is absolutely queer coded. If you don't see that, you know, you're being a little naive, I feel. Also, uh, Neferpitu, the malevolent cat, uh, uses they, them pronouns uh, canonically. Uh, oh, it, oh yeah, I didn't notice. That's a Neferpitu is, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't read in the Japanese, but uh, that is a thing. Well, that uh, seems so they, appropriate. They a non-binary character. That seems appropriate. So there's, there's queer, ele- I mean, there's a lot of queer elements to the, uh, to the, Frickin' Chimera Antarctic. We're gonna be queer and Hunter Hunter all over the well, place. Well, they, they be... introduced the like use of nuclear weapons, so it got a lot darker. There was this one part. Yes. There's this one part where like a, a nuclear bomb. They have a lot of footage of like bombs being dropped and a nuclear bomb hitting a city, and they have a whole long sequence of that. Mm-hmm. It gets really messed up. Look, I'm not saying that Hiroshima was justified, but. You know, the Japanese, they take lemons and they make lemonade out of it. We got a lot of great animes. No Grave of the Fireflies, Jesus. you know? No, oh, no. But no, no. <laughs> the, the show, in a way, justifies the use of nuclear weapons, sort of. Yeah. But it does it in, the, in a way that it still remains morally ambiguous, which yeah. I like. Because it is morally ambiguous to use them. And it's not, I don't, I still think it's morally wrong to use them uh, in the method but we nukes? did yeah i don't think you should use them to like end a war 
like that. By killing thousands and thousands of civilians? Yeah, don't do it on the civilians. That's fucked up. It's not... You can't do that. Why don't... Why didn't... Like... Not gonna bomb a whole city like that. But, hey, everyone was bombing cities like that. And, I mean, you know, you hear the defense like, well, we bombed Tokyo way more without using nuclear weapons. Uh, should we have just done that? Yeah, but, you know, nuclear... I, I mean, the thing which people lament about the use of nuclear weapons against civilians is it starts the nuclear era. And I think that particular demonstration of power, more so than just, you know, launching the weapons on uninhabited atolls, that that really showed what it was capable of, and it made everyone much more paranoid, which is, I think, the the most lamentable after effect of the use of the... I mean, beyond, you know, the horrifying murder and death, uh, uh, the most lasting effect was that enhanced paranoia. Yeah, I think the worst thing about using nukes was the hypocrisy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in in Twin Peaks season three, uh, the 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 crown jewel episode, the centerpiece episode, episode eight, theorizes that the uh, main antagonist of the series, Killer Bob, uh, emerged from the initial test of the nuclear weapon at uh, uh, in Nevada, hmm. and uh, frickin' uh, during that scene, he uses the Threnody for the victims of Hiroshima, the Pendereki beast. Oh, cool! Like, yeah. Is really a really affecting sequence, but talk. I mean, talk about like a traumatic event that spelled the difference between two eras, you know, before and after the 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 bomb. Uh, but I, yeah, that's what I would say. It wasn't. It wasn't the initial launch. It wasn't the initial testing of the nuke, but rather the use of it on civilians in a way that could be seen by the entire world. That was the traumatic event from which we still haven't recovered. That is the, you know, forget about 9-11, you know, forget about the killing of the Kennedys, forget about the, uh, the, the Manson murders, forget about any other massive uh, uh, traumatic event in America's history. The use of nukes was, that's, that's the world, you know, the, we, it's the nuclear era now, mm -hmm. and, we're still, and we're still there. I guess we keep forgetting, everyone, not enough conversation around imminent nuclear death. You know, everyone, we should always be talking about it. Uh, nuclear war. Oh. Nuclear war. Oh. It's a motherfucker. Oh. I, I guess mutually assured destruction has worked thus far. It seems like no one's really worried about nuclear war that much. Uh, uh, more so, people are worried about the environment. Yeah. Like, because, I, yeah, I, I don't know if mutually assured destruction works i mean there are so many times during the cold war when there's so many stories about you know some individual guy named sergey uh prevented world war three because he correctly assumed that the like the fail safe was wrong yeah and so he aborted and then the, the nukes were not launched i think there were a couple of those on the american side too yeah. i don't think we let it out as much but i'm i've heard a, at least one story of an american being like I decided not to launch the nukes because I knew it was just a flamingo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think, you know, while those stories are great, I, I'd like there to be less of those stories. Mm. Well, they're, they're harrowing and tense. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know we need to have so many individuals responsible for the potential annihilation of the world. Yeah, we should leave it in the hands <laughs> of a very uh, capable AI. You know, I would love that. You're right. If the, the AI decides who lives and who dies. Yeah, but the government contracts the AI to the lowest bidder, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's made out of crackers and stuff. Mm. <laughs> it's, We've made, but Jenkins, we've made a computational machine out of crackers. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're eating our machine. Stop, Jenkins. We should do an ad and send it to the, the government about our computational machine for handling <laughs> nuclear proliferation. Mm -hmm. um, a really mm -hmm. good marketing campaigns can go a lot further than you think. I think instead of the Olympics, we should just nuke a country each year. <laughs> we just get a... 
Well, here, I, I had an idea of uh, some things we could talk about. Um, let's explore our totalitarian fantasies. Okay. What are your totalitarian okay. fantasies? You Abo- first. Abolish the internet. Dest- okay. Destroy all smartphones. Arrest okay. all journalists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, going full anarcho primitive. Right. No, no, no. You can still do everything else. It's just that no one can know what's going on. <laughs> okay. You're, you're the anti information dictator. Right. I'm going for the stereotypical version of anarchy, which is chaos. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh,. The more chaos, the better. The less government, the better. And the less you can have, like, less than negative government right. Well, no, by, I, you know, by making the world more chaotic. I'm going for, like, cha- chaotism. I don't know what it would be called. I don't know if it's... Discordianism. Yeah. You've become a discordian. Well, like, sort of. I mean, they're generally neutral because they're they're trying to make, you know, the proper amount of, of entropy. Yeah. But you, you've, you're, you're chaotic evil, Steve. Right. You've chosen chaotic evil. I've chosen evil. chaotic evil. <laughs> So what? Yeah. It's not necessarily more or less government. It's whatever option is more chaotic. Like if it's more government, makes it more chaotic. Fine, but if it's less government, makes it more chaotic. We'll go less government. I think you could argue, like from that standpoint, that Biden was your guy. He, you know? he was my guy. Wait, of course, he was yeah. my guy. Who else? Who <laughs> else do I want to cap- be captaining the sinking imperial ship other than a guy who's like, I put my ice cream on my waffles. Uh, see with this face it took a lot of punches back in the day but it can punch you back son all the kids i'll climb down to the liquor ranch and get the hickory stick and flog (laughs) you like an old mister sir all the kids at the liquor store used to play with my chest hair (laughs) (laughs) they used to twirl it in their fingers and call them mr chest hairs and i let them do it because i was courteous um, so what is your uh, totalitarian fantasy? If you had to pick three edicts as dictator... What three would... edicts yeah. for my totalitarian fantasy. Um, uh, destroy all cars. No more cars. Uh, destroy destroy all... I'm going to expand that to destroy any fossil fuel burning thing. It's, it's all feet and bikes now. Mm-hmm. Feet and bikes. Okay. <laughs> We're done. Done with the fossil okay, fuels. Okay, what's number two? Uh, similar to you, destroy the internet, uh, cause that also is a lot of, I'm, I'm just going the, the ecology route. Right? Okay. Because the service, so uh, yeah, eco-fascism, yeah. Uh, no, it's not fascism because I think all the races should live in harmony, but not on the internet. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, so internet down, uh, no more, no more, uh, fossil fur burning vehicles and, um, uh, also, no more Irish. <laughs> oh, so eco-fascism it is for you. <laughs> oh, what a heel turn. Took a turn right at the yeah, end Yeah, heel there. turn uh, right no, at the no. end. So you are... No, I love the Irish. No, you we are, are basically Irish one of those... Show. You're like that WWE <laughs> English guy, like the pro-UK WWE guy who was a heel. Remember that guy? Is that a British bulldog? I maybe the British WWE. Uh, William William Regal. Yes, William Regal. William Regal. William Regal was fucking great. No, we don't. We don't <laughs> hate the Irish. I love the Irish. Uh, they're the best. Uh, my third edict would be um, uh, build a build enough housing so that everyone gets at least you know seven hundred square feet per person. Um, I mean, mine are very boring. Hmm. I would, I would build housing. Like, You're uh, gonna choose build housing over like, um, any you know, we, you could you could influence a, a, anything on the Bill of Rights. Like you could take any one of those out, and you won't. T- you'll leave them all. <laughs> uh, I I would force people to build housing. I would I okay. Would. <laughs> I would, I would, I would force the people using the houses to build their own housing. Interesting. So housing. <laughs> That's how I would solve housing, the housing fossil crisis. fuels. So you, how are we going to build housing without anything that burns fossil fuels? Uh, logs. We're going to go back to the old. <laughs> going to go back to the old style. All right. So you're kind of like a rewilding guy. 
We're going to have... Uh, I'm kind of like, everyone is a Kaczynski. Everyone is a Kaczynski unto themselves. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I just want to... I think mine is better. I just want to abolish the internet, destroy all smart smartphones, and arrest every journalist. So come live in my reality, folks. Arrest every journalist? Yeah. Even Matt Iglesias? My special guy? Yeah. My special little boy? <laughs> We would arrest them, and then they'd live in a penal colony. They would write their papers, and they and none of it could get out. They could just live in a closed society of journalists writing <laughs> writing their op-eds to each other. It's a gigantic <laughs> prison tower in, a, in an old lighthouse, and uh, it's called the Substack. Right. Oh, we would make the Substack colony, the Substack penal colony. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys think you're they're generating we're, we're whipping them as they're generating takes. you think you're so smart form your ideal little commune right now it'd be very funny if that was part of like the substack terms and conditions like five years into it Glenn Greenwald gets stolen away well, have, to, have to you, an island have you heard the, about these tiktok houses uh, I, I have heard about these TikTok houses. They seem talk about chaotic evil. You want to make talk a, about sowing chaos in the universe. You want to make a Substack house <laughs> <laughs> filled with the most annoying people on yeah. it. It's Glenn Greenwald, Matt Iglesias, uh, Jesse Single. They're all living together in one house, yeah, Matt, and they're complaining about who ate the Chex mix. Matt Taibbi uh, is another one that Matt would be Taibbi. there. <laughs> Matt Taibbi, they're rubbing his head for luck. Oh, man. I think I once said Matt Taibbi looks like soy Billy Corgan, and I stand by it. Yeah, he's the worst. Despite all my rage, I'm still just a Rolling Stone guy. Uh, I, despite mm. all my rage, cancel culture is popular with my age. I don't know. Yeah, being annoyed at cancel culture is, is it a very annoying trait, and I figured out why. Mm -hmm. Um because cancel culture is like just it's not the real way our society is dysfunctional that's it's it's a very surface level um thing to be annoyed about that's it's not that it doesn't exist or it does exist it's just yeah. like there's way 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 bigger problems um yeah it, well, it's like it's like say it's like all lives matter. It's you know it's a sh of course all lives matter, but that's a shallow and fatuous statement because it doesn't address the problem, which is the disproportionate amount of uh, uh, murders that black people yeah. face. Yeah, I the mean, police. I have a different problem with that, which is this tendency to like we got to make a slogan, we got to sloganize it. Like, why right. can't why can't the slogan be there's like a tendency for police to be racist? And well, that's not uh, that's not uh, catchy. Okay, but when you, gotta you, be, you gotta get you gotta you can't have a nuanced slogan. That's not the point of slogan. Well, they gotta be they gotta stick in your head. My we're here. My point. We're queer. We don't want any more bears. You know? Slogans aren't really great because it's a it's a complicated topic. So I guess uh, well, slow, I mean it, you can you can see it in the split between Black Lives Matter the phrase which everyone you know, pretty much agrees with, I mean, everyone in general who's like on the left or on the general center liberal side agrees with, to the organization Black Lives Matter, which is run by a bunch of weird grifters. Uh, uh, well, you know, and that's, I, I'm, I'm the reverse. I'm less cool with the phrase and more cool with the people running the grifters. <laughs> You're more cool with the grifters. Yeah, whatever's the more chaotic bag. option, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with Sean King embezzling a lot of money from, like, the Haitian Children's Fund. Yeah, whatever. well, there was, um, um, that profile about, um, is it, who, who was the little boy who was shot by the police? Is it? There have been now that there have been multiple. I'm getting their names wrong because there was one recently. There's uh, yeah, there was one. There was a, a man recently named Winston Smith, who was shot by the police. Uh, the one that was shot a uh, while ago. Is it Tamir Rice? Yeah. Um, so Tamir Rice's mm -hmm. mother, her name is. Let me see if I can find her name. Mm-hmm. So Tamir Rice's mother, I don't have her name on the Yahoo mm. News story, was accusing okay. Tamika Mallory, who's a black li in the Black Lives Matter, like mm -hmm. 
I don't know, organization of quote yeah. unquote monopolizing the fight for racial justice. Um, and she says, you Black Lives Matter, uh, I guess bitches, writing these families backs. So y'all have fucked up our fight, says the mother of Miss Rice. Look at this yeah. clout chaser, basically. Um, so there's tension about Black Lives Matter in the in the in the yeah like, yeah. I, there's absolutely. I mean, there has been for a long time. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there are individual chapters of Black Lives Matter. I'm sure that are are totally blameless and are good and are helpful to the community. But like the larger organization, the people at the top seem to be sort of. Um, uh, not so, or, you know, it's the same with any fucking charity or NGO that becomes too big for its britches, uh, and just inevitably becomes a capitalist monster, like the Susan G. Komen Foundation or something like, which is famously corrupt, and famously a lot of their breast cancer money just goes to the overhead of these, uh, of these highly paid PMC NGO executives yeah. who wear their Devil Wears Prada suits and they walk around town like they're Queen of the Bean, but they don't understand what poor people really need. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I, don't know I guess uh, her name is Samaria Rice. I guess she's Samaria having Rice. having some disagreements with Black Lives Matter. I guess the, the, the idea is that they're, like, cashing in on her son's death. Yeah, like I mean, th there's, I mean, it's it's weird that industry crops up where people are, uh, you know, you sell T-shirts with George Floyd's face on them, you know, what is what is that, you know, are you is that blood money or is that is something else? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to sell T-shirts with George Floyd's face on them? Do they go to his family? I'm sure there are people that sell George Floyd T-shirts where the funds don't go to their family. Uh, but I, I I don't know. Talk about you know. Uh, we talk about mythologizing of people. That's what we do to these victims of police violence as well. And we develop a weird, fucked up version of nostalgia for that as well. Mm. Like when you saw all those bad takes when George Floyd said, this man, he sacrificed his body so that right. we could fight on. You know? Nancy Pelosi's um, weird. Let me, let me see if I can pull that up. That was so weird. Yeah. So yeah, you talk about the the prevalence of our need to aggrandize unhealthily uh, a need to make stuff out of the past and turn it into legend but you know that's what we always do i don't know is it just a feature of america is america do that more um well probably not anymore because we're americanizing the world uh with our mm. media so i think it's done more in other countries like france france copies us you know you guys you follow in our wake um, you probably is do there it. like are Russians nostalgic for like yeah. Gorbachev era? Yeah, Russians are nostalgic. Um, but in a but you talk about nostalgic deeper, cultures like a, the, the fucking Greeks, right. you know, <laughs> or the fucking. It's deeper. It's like a deeper thing there. I would say it's different. It the, Americans have a superficial, like kind of fake, manufactured nostalgia. Like everything in America is mm. like manufactured and fake and bullshit and cheap. Um, yeah. And that's what's spreading. I think Russians have like a deep, like soulful nostalgia that is very hard to understand unless you're from there. Um, they have all Maybe these. Maybe it's like, not that. They have all these like weird poets that they love that they like give house tours of constantly. They're jerking off over their dead poets. Yeah, Italians love their goddamn fucking Renaissance painters. Get over your nostalgia. Or stop living in the past, Italians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Uffizi galleries, more like the Yushitsi galleries, I say. Yeah. Fucking Caravaggio, suck my Caravagina. <laughs> a fucking Chiaroscuro, more like Chiaro Scrotum. Mm, Fuck you. Mm, mm, keep it coming. Uh, okay, yeah, we're doing we're doing some Renaissance painting. Rembrandt, more like Cumbrandt. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking stupid. Uh oh my god. Uh I mean a lot all devotional painting is just nostalgia for Jesus, you know. Uh, I don't I that doesn't make that's no 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 no. It's no. nostalgia for Jesus. Uh, no, 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 I've no, no, clearly no. understand 
Maybe. Um, so what you're saying is that nostalgia or like the way that we understand nostalgia is differentiated from, say, uh, a more deeply felt or more innately experienced longing for the past that other cultures seem to be more in touch with. I, I mean, I would say the same thing of like there's a difference between nostalgia and like, say, cultural ritual. I like doing the Passover ritual. I, I like doing Purim. I actually like a lot of Jewish holidays and experiencing that because it is a way to feel connected. The idea that every year throughout the history of Judaism, everyone has gathered together like this. And, you know, even if it's not true, you, it's the idea of you can feel the resonant psychic energy of every Jew gathering at a table throughout time in order to, you know, worship, uh, mm. not worship, or in order to commemorate our escape from bondage. And, you know, that we wouldn't consider that nostalgia. It's not nostalgic to, you know, you know, at some point, nostalgia descends into myth, which descends into story, which descends into sort of animating ideas about who we are and what we ought to be and, you know, what our culture represents. So, you know, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> you know, yeah. Maybe it's just the early well. stage of the, the early stage of any mythologizing is cringe. I'm sure, like, Jesus, when he first came on the scene, everyone's like, Jesus is so fucking cringe, you know? He's just, like, doing nostalgia for, like, when stuff wasn't controlled by the Romans. That's so cringe. <laughs> That's uh, inaccurate, I would say. He's not doing... I don't know. Like, he's, not harkening, he's not harkening back to the time before the Romans. I don't know what I don't know what nostalgia Jesus was doing. No, Jesus was not really doing nostalgia, but that doesn't mm. matter um, because myth. Jesus was a moment in which myth collided with the man's individual consciousness awaking. So it's like that is when, the mm. end of myth was when Jesus occurred, and um, that it's that's a fascinating topic. You when you you can take classes on um, Jesus and myth and how. That you know, where does the historical Jesus intersect with mythical Jesus? Because uh, there's a lot of mm -hmm. elements of the Jesus story that <clears throat> are very yeah. similar to myths, and there's also some historical proof that he existed. So he's one yeah, of these. There, Jesus was a guy. Muhammad was a guy as yeah. well. And you know, everything past Jesus becomes this religion's past uh, past Christianity. I mean, Abrahamic ones. Uh, but I think even cultures around the world are influenced by the fact that myth and actual history collide uh, yeah. as opposed to just pure abstract, you know, gods of our legends. Yeah, and that's always the interesting, unique part of every culture is where they have their uh, myth and history, where, where that inflection point is. Um, mm -hmm. be a, it'd be a fun to go back in time and find societies we'd never we've never we don't have any record of and get their inflection points uh it is interesting mm -hmm. how the muslims have a have a have a closer in time one yeah well one that is like it, we know that muhammad was definitely a guy there is lots of proof that muhammad existed oh yeah so yeah as opposed to jesus where it's slightly more nebulous uh, yeah. or like whether jesus was a composite of a bunch of different guys in yeah. the era no i think there was a, a there's Probably a guy, and one guy yeah. who led a sect, led a little, made it started a little cult. The cult got real popular, and um, and then they were very good oh, yeah. at marketing because they would. Because <laughs> well, never mind, they were very good at litigating. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> they sued anyone that stole the yeah. the Jesus uh, ex the Jesus uh, brand. Excuse me, are uh, you using Jesus brand uh, tropes? This copyright <laughs> Christian Corporation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Simon. Yes, I am a lawyer for the Christian Corporation. <laughs> are you saying that? Are you saying that the group of Jews that founded Christianity? Uh, yeah, they were the <laughs> were super, being stereotypically. They Jewish. were the. <laughs> they were the super Jews. They were the best at. at um, they were the best out of all of them. Let, which let is me why, prove yeah. to you how we are right. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of, like, uh, all of the apostles seeing the cross. It's like, look, he's being tortured, but that's a great symbol. That's a great logo, you know, that really <laughs> pops in the eye. My favorite thing is how he can make a meal for very little money by just multiplying loaves, multiplying fishes. 
And oh, he's good. <laughs> I'm with whatever he is now. I used to be Jewish, but this guy, he says he's Jewish, but he's like super Jewish. Yeah. It's always, that's always funny. I, how I was taught in Catholic school about like Messianic Jews, the Catholic, so the Catholics mm-hmm. are like, there's still hope. We can still convert them. <laughs> <laughs> Catholics are very uh, evangelical. They really want to convert the whole world. Well, yeah, if you believe you have the righteous path to heaven, you know, you think you're doing a mikvah for people. You don't see it as intrusive. <laughs> so don't you don't understand. You're going to hell, yeah. you weirdo. Who wouldn't want to not go to hell, you fucking asshole, you know? Um, uh, I get where they... I mean, I get where the abortion people are coming from. They literally think you're killing babies. Yeah. They literally think, you know, it's... Uh, I don't think that. Uh, well, this is why I, we like, need I world. I feel that we need world two. Okay, we need a second world, and then we can. So, because it's never going to work on one world. Too many different kinds of people who all want to control the entire world. So we have to colonize Mars and send all the anti-abortion people to Mars. <laughs> We're going to have anti-abortion Mars. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice if we could do that? I'm all for it. Yeah, but the problem is they all die from coat hanger infections in the first year. <laughs> oh, because you think that they'd have people who would then end up wanting abortions even though... They- well, they would they would set up a no-abortion planet, but then uh, everyone would want abortions yeah. and everyone would die doing it themselves. Well, hey, then, you know, then serves them right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Karma, bitches. That's, that's right. That's... That's my awesome sci-fi idea. World 2, anti-abortion world. If there's something I definitely don't believe in, it's karma. Hmm. <laughs> that is just something that is like, there is so much evidence against this being a thing. Yeah. People do not get their come up. I'm more of a believer in fortune now than I used to be. Like sometimes... As in for- pure like, luck? Yeah, sometimes fortune smiles upon you and you have like a string of good luck and then sometimes it does not. Yeah, but that yeah, the randomness of it's going with the flow, baby. It's, it's Taoism, or uh, Tolkien, as Tolkien would put it, the you catastrophic, you catastrophic event. Sometimes, when all hope is lost, and it seems like you're dying on a volcanic mountain, uh, a bunch of giant birds come mm-hmm. and save you. Yep. Yeah, that happened so, to me. I don't know. I, have you ever had a you catastrophic event in your life, like when you were at a very low point, and then something happened that seemed miraculous and it was enough to get you out of it um i mean probably maybe i don't really know nothing that i can remember because my mem- my memory is just shot it's just gone from from the drinking as you said before yeah. like your ancestors before you yeah we have well, no we don't idea. know because they drank yeah <laughs> right well, i have no idea like, i mean maybe i did some stuff once but like no one knows mm-hmm uh, what about you? You <laughs> must have something in mind. <clears throat> um, uh, no, I, I was just asking. I don't think I've ever had. I don't think I've ever had a moment where I've been. You know, uh, I mean, I've been incredibly low. But the thing that saved me w- when I had a noose around my neck was that choking to death really hurt. Yeah. So that that I guess you could call that a you catastrophic event. I mean, in some ways, like uh, I've been. Uh, I'll I'll get a little real with the audience. I've attempted suicide a couple times before, uh, both by hanging. Uh, I'm not uh, particularly proud of it, but I talk about it openly because I think uh, you give people insight. Uh, and, uh, the first time I didn't get to the rope around my next stage, the first time I had made the rope and was going around, uh, the North Carolina woods in a complex <laughs> searching for a beam That's to funny. hang myself off of. And while well, I, I was don't... doing that, I was like, I don't want to die here. That was when you were being, <laughs> that was, a, that was when you were being a lawyer for the, the public in North Carolina. I was a public defender. I lost my I lost my scholarship to the school and was like, oh, I'm feeling very sad right now. So I'll fashion a noose and go around looking for places to kill myself. Uh, And then I didn't do that. Second time, uh, I was in a much lower place, just a real nadir of depression uh, when I finally realized I, I, you know, uh, because I was forcing myself to be a lawyer and I really didn't want to be a lawyer. And it was enough to cause 
such a, a shrieking anxiety and fear of the future in me that it was like, well, I, I fucking need to kill myself. That's it. I've made this life for myself. And I got to the choking stage. Uh, and then uh, I was able to get myself off. I didn't do a very good job. Wait, you were able to get it yourself is, off? I was able to autoerotically asphyxiate like David Carradine. Okay. No, I was able to. I was able to get down. Oh, okay. Uh, I, okay. <laughs> and uh, and then went into the ward the day after that. Uh, and that's when they made. That's was, when they cut your dick off, right? In the ward. Yeah, but <laughs> that they cut my dick off in the ward. Yeah. And now I, I'm I'm uh, I'm dickless. I am Hedwig in the Angry Inch. No, um, but that's the thing about a suicide attempt is when you're in the middle of a suicide attempt and you're having that like crazy adrenaline rush, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Um, you realize, oh, I like surviving. Surviving's actually kind of good. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, yeah, uh, death is uh, the ultimate absurdity. It's what we live with every day. And I think that's why we hearken back to the past because it's a time when death was farther away, especially to our own childhoods. It's a time when, you know, we don't understand death as well and time is longer. And it seems we're further away from that deadline. Um, so what I'm saying is periodically attempt to kill yourself mm. in, order to, <laughs> in order to gain new insight. I mean, that's why extreme sports exist. I think that's why people jump out of planes or do roller coasters is to simulate that feeling of having a little touch of a near death experience. If you're thinking of killing yourself, help is out there. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1 800 273 8255. Yeah. Probably have a trigger warning for this episode a frank discussion of suicide. Um, but, uh, you know, mine weren't, compared to other suicide attempts, mine weren't that bad. Um, like, I don't have any, didn't have any scars, I didn't cut myself, I didn't overdose, and didn't get any brain damage or anything, like, didn't shoot myself. Yep, just, or anything just like that. further embarrassing proof of failure. <laughs> yeah, can't, oh, I can't even <laughs> kill myself right. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's good to fail suicide attempts. Please, more suicide attempts should be failed. That's what I think. Yeah, well, that's why I didn't buy a gun. Ever. Yes, that's also why I don't Can't buy a gun. gun. Can't yeah. do it. I would love to. Are you kidding me? I want to live my tanky nah. fantasy, but no, I will kill myself right away. I can't. I don't I don't go that route. I, I just disallow my, like, I disallow having the opinion that guns are cool. Like, if I can't have something, then I'm going to say it's not cool because, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm going to say, uh, no, they're not cool and they're lame and I can't have one because I'm too cool for that. And that's how I. Can uh, do it. We. That's why we should change the name of guns to CSMs or convenient suicide machines. What if guns were called zits? Then no one would want them. No <laughs> one want them anymore. They're called zits. Gross. Ew. I don't want them. Oh, you got. I don't a, want to hold a zit in my hand. I don't want to squeeze you it. You got a big zit and it's shooting stuff. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I would like to be able to projectile pop my pimples onto people. Oh, that's funny. I would, yeah, that'd be a cool thing. Imagine if you had one big enough that you could you could hit someone in the eye with your zit juice. Mm -hmm. Holy shit! Mm -hmm. What a great that's superpower. a that's a recurring Mad Magazine fantasy. Really? No. Well, I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty of Mad Magazines where someone has launched a zit pus onto somebody. That seems like a gag that has been well worn, but. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm sure you could see it in real life, too. People like those uh, zit-popping videos. You ever watch those Dr. Pimple Popper videos? No, I don't like those. Boo. The I don't like the pimple one, but but I must confess, the one where they're removing the blackheads, that's that's the good sauce. Yeah. All those little grease worms coming out of some guy's nose. Mm, he, I bet, he, uh, bet his pores feel so clean and breathe so nice afterwards. Mm. I'd rather mm. I'd rather watch people like break their bones or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you ever seen that footage of Anderson Silva breaking his knee against? Uh, uh, I forget what his opponent's yeah, name was. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, 
Yeah, oh my god, terrifying footage. Yeah, I or, like that. Um, I like fight videos. I like bully bully fight videos that come out every so often. That's why TikTok's great now cuz we're really seeing the horrifying nature of American public schools. Um <laughs> But, you wanted euphoria. Right. Here you go. Oh, here's here's a video of what it's like to be in public school, and it's just like kids beating the shit out of each other and screaming at each other, and the teachers being like, "What do I do?" Sometimes the teachers have a weapon that they use, that they get to use when they, they hit kids who are fighting. It's the only time you can. Hey, hit you need kids. a telescoping rod. Yeah, well, this one guy, this one teacher. That's how he um, stopped a fight. There are these this like brawl in the classroom, <laughs> and he took out a leather whip and was smacking kids to get and it hurt so much that they would stop fighting and run away (laughs) he's like just slapping kids left and right uh that's fucked up it looks like being a being a public school teacher looks like a lot of fun now that um, they have a new job requirement which is enforcing three to six feet of distance at all times Mm. in schools because of coronavirus absolutely mm. insane job requirement to like keep the kids from touching each other no effing way would i do that job now i can't imagine it uh. fucking being a teacher i mean i don't think either of us are the teacher types because you gotta you sort of need like patience and you sort of have to like kids or you have to like the idea of instilling people with knowledge or right. I don't know who becomes a teacher. People who want to instill knowledge and like do do good for this for this community, which is you know you have that mo- way more than I do it because you worked as a public defender. Yeah, but I yeah, but I, part of my thing as a lawyer was realizing that I ultimately failed at that because I'm much more devoted to my selfish creative pursuits. Yeah, that is ultimately the thing which gives me my brain mojo. I tried helping out people in order to give me some sort of peace of mind. But it just taking on their burdens just led me to feel more anxious and distressed. And I realized I couldn't I didn't have the the peace of mind to be that sort of helper type person. All I can do is, you know, heckle, <laughs> which but I'll heckle, I'll heckle the best a heckler's ever been. Damn it. Well, that's good. Um uh, but I think, you know, that's sort of that that painful thing, you know, reckoning with who you are and that you're not as good as a person as you thought you were. And, you know, having such a severe reaction to it, um, that's sort of part of forming your identity. Yeah. And, you know, now that I had a traumatic moment of my identity, I am patching it over with bits of nostalgia. Very uh, cool. Like Twin Peaks. Very yeah. cool. Well, that's why it's always good to start off life with rather low self-esteem and then build up. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the very boomer opinion. That's what they think, you know, millennials are raising their kids wrong because they're giving them too much self-esteem. Gotta, yeah. You gotta, you know, make the kid hate itself and then it will learn to love itself. That's, well, you know, that's the classic tiger mother thing. You know, you're going you're gonna to play the piano until your hands are bloody. Right. Um, I'm going to stab you in the kidneys if you get it wrong. I had a, a, a funny note about, like, blaming feeling shame on systemic shame culture or system, <laughs> systemic <laughs> shaming. It's like, yeah. the only reason I feel embarrassed for cutting you in line is because of a culture of systemic shaming. Just ways <laughs> ways right-wing people will try to use the word systemic to, like, subvert things, but they're just bad at it. <laughs> uh, I, I when uh, a lot of the Palestinian stuff was popping off a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, one of the larger protests at Nathan Phillips Square and some uh, pro-Israel counter protesters had come and everyone in the Palestine crowd was shouting shame mm. at them. Shame. Yeah, shame. That's just... And I was doing it, too, you yeah. know, because it's fun to shout shame seriously as a person it's fun to point at them and go shame 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 yeah it's fun that's our systemic shame systemic culture. shaming is fun um yeah. it happens but like systemic shaming is a way of uh societal correction i think um, yeah i mean that's i mean that is what cancel uh, at the end of the day cancel culture is just another word for 
shame shame me. Yeah, we're do- like, something we've done since time immemorial. We always do this. Everyone does this, and there's yeah. other ways society is dysfunctional, like. When you think about the Scarlet Letter is about cancel culture, you know. <laughs> it, well, yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. and so kind of is uh, The Crucible in another way. Yeah, there you go. Those women were canceled. Um, yeah, witches be canceled. Um. <laughs> yeah. Not the baby witches now. We've gone too far. We've allowed the baby witches to turn the direction of the moon or whatever. So Whatever that stupid means. I was walking down the sidewalk and I saw like a uh, a devil star, like a satanic star, and then I saw some like Ooh. incantations and chalk written, and I'm like, man, these I gotta like step off the sidewalk in case I am walking on top of like a horrible curse that the neighbor witch wrote on the sidewalk in chalk. So I, I mean, what if it's a helpful curse though? Uh, like giving me good fortune, I considered that, yeah. but my fortune has been good already, so I yeah. feel like I, I got a good thing going. Why trifle, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, Fortuna. Oh, man, I'm so sick of that song. Uh, <laughs> I'd suck some dick, let's suck some dick right now. I'd suck some dick. Let's suck some dick. Let's suck some dick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's fuck and suck. Let's suck a dick. Let's suck a dick in my ass. <laughs> let's yes. fuck and suck. <laughs> Sorry, now I can't have yes. oh, the, the dick fortuna in my head. Uh, that's like pretty much all I got, uh, for the show. I the last thing I have written down is like boring. It's just about how Americans, you know, when you, when, a, when an American immigrates somewhere, no, sorry, mm-hmm. when an American emigrates, when they leave America and they move somewhere else, they stay American. But when someone mm. moves here, they become American, they lose their nationality. Um, so that's an interesting mm-hmm. thing that happens. Well, that is in in history class. That was taught to me as the differentiation between Canada and America, whereas America views itself as a melting pot where everyone just comes together in a single monocultural goo. Uh, In Canada, we call ourselves the patchwork quilt, where where everybody gets to preserve. That's an actual thing that was proliferated in 90s children's Canadian textbooks, history textbooks. Uh, calling ourselves a patchwork quilt in opposition to the melting pot theory. The idea that we allow individual communities to preserve more of their culture than America, which I don't think is... I mean, America hybridizes its cultures, but America has lots of little enclaves of little preserved cultures. You know, you can you can go to your uh, neighbors there in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, well, so you know, what, to see like yeah. a pretty but what, uh, Muslim what community. What America encourages is like a cutthroat, doing that in a, the most cutthroat way possible. So if a community wants to be able to do that, they have to like produce someone who's going to be able to like be a corrupt community leader (laughs) and like steal steal enough real estate from the italians to be able to build your own small neighborhoods like the irish have to like form a mafia to beat the italians and that's basically what we we get that yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's uh, that's uh yeah it's it's not really a melting pot then it's more just like a a battleground well it's a melting pot now because it we're Oh, yeah. There's a crazy heat wave about to start in the southwest. Uh-oh. It's going to be... People are going to die. Yeah. A lot of homeless people are in danger in the southwest right now. Um, it's probably going to be like 120, like, out... That's it's too much? Yeah. In, like, places where people live. I'm not talking about just Death Valley. Um, I followed In, this... like, in, in Tucson or something? Um, yeah, parts of Arizona, Southern California... Uh, it's going to be like over a hundred. Bakersfield has a projected high today, or I guess is this from today? No, a little, a couple days ago of 107. It's going to get higher than 107 in California. Mm. So that's crazy. Yeah, we really done fucked up the earth. 
Yeah, you know, it's all good, you know, because, like, mahalo, you know, but... <laughs> yeah, mahalo. Um, I mean, always mahalo, uh, we have to remember. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing why the eco-tanky line isn't even... Uh, it's not even a thing, because it's like, we're we're past the tipping point already. Maybe just go grill pill. Maybe just go full-on black pill. It's like, fuck it, let's, let's, let's tango in into this apocalypse yeah. and, you know, try and provide the best for us on our own, but, you know, try and live as best... We can while resigning ourselves to the fate that uh, in 70 years, things are going to be much, 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 much worse for everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, this kind of it reminds me of the attitude of like freshman year when we were all you know, freshmen during the three weeks before college started where the college, um, you know, has a, had a really bad idea that they should get all the freshmen together to party for three weeks while they pretend to learn right, stuff. Yeah. And one thing yeah. we would do uh, outside our dormitory we would pour lighter fluid on the ground and just light it on fire and sit around it like it was a campfire and just keep <laughs> keep pouring lighter fluid on the cement and keep burning it. Uh, it's just a really efficient use of resources. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that lighter fluid's really burning. Yeah. Yeah. Pour some more. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's real cool. Light fluid's really pretty. That's just support. We're we're free. We're adults. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that just revived my hope in humanity. Honestly, I think you know that's the best of us is when we just do something dumb and pointless. Agreed. Yeah. Well, that's the show, folks. So tune in next All week. All right. Tune in next week. We're gonna have a bone-in sandwich.